Dr. Holtorf and I are kindred spirits uh, being fellow uh, retired anesthesiologist <laughs> from, <laughs> from way back. And um, I met Dr. Holtorf at one of the uh, peptide seminars that um, he was one of the presenters and um, just very, very impressed with his, you know, acumen and uh, the medical businesses that he has built over the years. And of course, um, his passion for peptides um, has been a fascinating story that I'm sure he'll share with us. So, um, and um, yeah, definitely one of the preeminent um, specialists in this area. And I've learned a lot over, I don't know, probably the last, I don't know, five or six years that I've been, you know, in the peptide universe and um, continuing to learn. So yeah, Dr. Holtorf, why don't you kind of tell us about uh, what you have to offer. And, and we have, you know, we have a group of what we call citizen scientists, uh, mainly lay people, but we have, you know, uh, practitioners on as well. And usually uh, we have, a, you know, 7,500 or more people on uh, live, but um, very astute group of um, participants. I love it. I love it. Uh, just out of curiosity, what are your top three favorite peptides? Oh, well, I mean, the ones that I use most, of course, the BPC-157, the thymus and alpha-1, which, of course, really can't get that, that particular one anymore, thymus and beta-4. But, of course, I know you have, you know, um, structured uh, some similar uh, type products. But, you know, I, of course, I really still you know, utilize, I utilize both your product line as well as the compounding pharmacies because yeah, at least yeah. some and, of the- And we're in stock, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so at least some of the compounding pharmacies are, you know, uh, having some of the, the ones that were previously not able to be obtained. Uh, they're bringing them back slowly, you know, so uh, in an injectable form. So, so that's uh, yeah. pretty cool. All right. Let's see. I think the camera is working. Let me turn it off now. <laughs> we just we just see your name, so it's not a problem. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Oh wait, that's weird. But we do see the screen. We do see your. What we're looking at is like slide 55 or somewhat. Uh, yeah. testimonial. How do you incorporate it? And of course, you know, I've used the whole host of them, you know, the KPV, the CJC 1295, Ipamorelin, uh, because, you know, I also, you know, do mainly male hormone replacement. And um, so that was, um, and still is a mainstay. Um, as well in terms of growth yeah. hormone. I, we're really loving KPV. There you go. Yes. We're seeing you now. <laughs> there we go. Good, and, good. Uh, and KPV, I think, uh, is is going to overtake like BPC. Okay, good, good. Um, and uh, we're coming out with new delivery models that because uh, it is it is very fragile, but. Yes. Um, it's so great for like mast cell, lower inflammation. Um, and so I, I made someone a bet <laughs> that KPP uh -huh. will overtake BPC, but there's no end date. So. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. But yeah, I've used, um, I've used all of your product line. Uh, fabulous. Um, the Cerebral Pep, you know, the KPV, you know, TB4 Frag, all of those. So you've come out with a really, really amazing product line to make this, you know, uh, more affordable and easier to utilize in an in a oral form because of course, everyone doesn't necessarily want to inject themselves. So, um, so yeah, so that's- Yeah, uh, and we're, awesome. we're coming out with, you know, liposomal, but not liposomal, like so many liposomal you know, they take some lecithin and phosphatidylcholine, shake it up, and they mm -hmm. call it liposome, you know. Okay. And it's with actually a big pharma company, um, I, I guess, uh, dealing with the devil, but um, yeah. <laughs> that 
where they, you know, look at an electric scanning microscope and make sure they're stable. Beautiful. And so it really extends the half-life and the bioavailability. Um, awesome. So we're excited about that. And that's going to also expand the uh, repertoire of, of peptides. Beautiful, beautiful. And but, before you start real quick, I will definitely say I truly feel that the peptides have been integral in my reversal of my and the slowing of my aging process, you know, based on true diagnostics. So, you know, my chronological <laughs> age is 60, but my biological age is 50. And, nice. you know, nice. yeah. So I've been on peptides for at least six, seven years. Yeah. So I, I don't know if I'll just give a quick summary of my story. Absolutely. That'd be uh, very good. Uh, yeah. We have a few people that don't know what, didn't yeah. understand the uh, side talk, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, peptides saved my life, basically. Um, uh, was, was basically, gr growing up, I always had something weird with like half of my body would sweat. Uh, they were absolutely freezing cold. One pupil was always bigger than the other. Um, I went to the ER a couple of times as a blown pupil and they can't find anything, you know. Um, but, but doing okay. And uh, as I went through college and med school and residency, I started just getting so fatigued, like, but my brain just couldn't tolerate any stress at all. And I was just dying. And, you know, so I went to the university doctor, oh, you're stressed, da, da, da. And I'm like, I'm not stressed. I can't function. And, um, uh, and, and so, and I was, I'm, well, it was very evidence-based. I'm still very evidence-based. And I would, you know, it was ingrained in our school, at least, don't do anything alternative. It means no evidence, right? And, but I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to die. I, I, I got to quit medicine. So I snuck off to some alternative conferences and I'm like, damn, they are more evidence-based than what they're teaching us. And um, so then I started on, um, I mean, they had peptides at that point, but it was uh, more optimizing hormones, the gut, uh, some immune modulators. I'm like, well, I feel pretty good. So I'm getting out of anesthesia. Um, I went into family practice and then I went through a stressful divorce. You know, when your wife hires Gloria Allred as a consultant, you know, you're in trouble. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, and then all of a sudden, just hit me like a ton of bricks. I couldn't get out of bed. I went into heart failure. I could not stand up. I could not walk upstairs. And so I'm just like, I can't live like this. I'm going to either off myself or go get this fixed. And kind of went basically around the world looking at, you know, unique treatments, did some crazy things, but did a lot of things that helped. And um, I love plasmapheresis, ozone, and then I was in Belgium, and I took some peptides. I really didn't think much of it, and then about three days later, I'm like, wait a minute, I just walked up the stairs upright. Like, what's going on here, you know? And and then so basically, kind of brought those back and really used them in our in our practice, and then started kind of you know teaching uh, about them. And it's really revolutionary. Say it again, my life's been revolutionized by them, and we just see it all the time with these, you know, difficult to treat, you know, or multi-system illness uh, <laughs> is is where they really shine. But also even just for optimal health and and things like that. So um, yeah, I'm I'm uh, a big fan. And everyone we, we teach, we're going to have a training program starting in January, a year long, um, that I, it, it just, you can't imagine not using them anymore, you know, right. but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. So I kind of picked a, um, uh, a topic that, you know, kind of encompasses a number of things, but I really think immune modulation is, is really a key to so many illnesses, and we'll, and we'll discuss why. Um, yeah. So yeah. 
No, you're good. We just, oh, someone just uh, came. Just disclosure, Chief Medical Officer, uh, National Academy of Hypothyroidism. If anyone's treating people with thyroid and suppressing a TSH or treating with normal levels, please go to that site, download some studies and have them in the chart. So there's about a thousand references showing that the way we practice uh, diagnose and treat hypothyroidism in this country is wrong. So, um, and then integrated peptides. And we just started a pharma company, uh, KJ Biopharm. So we're starting IND trials and, um, and that, I guess, for all my sins. Um, <laughs> and this is the, to the right is the attorney's dis <laughs> disclaimer, but just whatever I say is doesn't reflect any company, doesn't reflect what you guys say or, you know, think. So it's just my own words and experiences. So what, what are the goals for today? It's really to understand how uh, uh, chronic infections or really chronic illness always, if, well, you can never say, oh, I guess, almost always, um, uh, results from this immune shift. So if you think of it, again, this is a, a oversimplification, which you have to do with the immune system. Think of a Th1 on this side, gets stuff inside the cell. Uh, this side, Th2 gets stuff outside the cell. Now, as your thymus involutes, as you get older, it starts going like this. And when you look at, and I have a graph on this, for the thymus, activity goes to its lowest. That's when all these diseases of aging start. So, and you know, there's a trim trial where they rejuvenated the thymus with growth hormone, um, which I'm surprised it worked actually. But um, my, my thought is like, why wouldn't you just replace the thymic peptides, you know? And uh, even the CDC showed that, you know, over the age of I think it's 55 or 60, uh, uh, people have at least one disease caused from the involution of the thymus. So it's like, why don't we, why don't we fix that? But so immune modulation for longevity, uh, acceleration of healing, um, uh, you know, basically given in, in conjunction with other things I like peptides a lot, because it, there's really nothing you can't give them with, to tell you the truth. Everything from systemic illness, uh, autoimmunity, nerve damage, traumatic brain injury, Alzheimer's, um, you know, uh, joint issues, gut issues. Um, so it has a very broad spectrum of effect. And when I first gave these talks, everyone's like, this sounds like snake oil. And it's, a, it's <laughs> like, but there's studies on, on all these things. And everything in medicine really is a vicious cycle. And when you get this immune dysfunction, what happens is you get increased inflammation. So then that affects the mitochondria, you get a cell danger response. And then it uh, affects the hypothalamic pituitary, there are the pineal hypothalamic pituitary hormone access, where like, let's say thyroid, the TSH is low, but your thyroid's low. We always think thyroid's easy. TSH is high, your thyroid's low. TSH is low, your thyroid's high. No, that's not the way it works. And you actually get um, a low TSH and a high T4 to, oh, high thyroid. No, that is the marker of uh, low thyroid from you know chronic illness. And we see it all the time. If you look at depressed patients, they're very likely going to have a low normal TSH and a high normal T4 because there's no mitochondrial function and thyroid is not doesn't diffuse in the cell. It needs energy. And T4 is actually more energy dependent than T3, which is why T3 tends to work much better. And you know, and then you get you know insulin resistance, you get you know gut issues, and you get the gut brain access. In the brain gut access, uh, you activate all the mast cells, we'll show how that happens, or the microglia. Same thing, you get uh, neurodegeneration, immune activation of coagulation, which we're finding 
a ton of after all these vaccines, but I don't want to get controversial there, but um, <laughs> we're with you on that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, did, did you get the um, ebook on uh, peptides? Yes, I, uh, I posted the link. Oh, great. There's a, there's a chart in there that kind of has all the, all the peptides, but uh, yeah. So um, really, you know, different peptides for uh, different things. And, you know, I didn't put it in presenter mode, did I? So what, what we usually have is, you know, everything's multifactorial. We're just getting bombarded by toxins, and, uh, which then, you know, lower immunity, then you get a chronic infection, which makes it worse. Um, and then that just sets off this vicious cycle. Um, and stress, if you look at all these conditions, it's kind of a, um, a, a tripod of uh, a basic chronic infection, toxins, and stress. And people underplay stress. Oh, they're distressed. But we'll, sh we'll show how stress is a huge, not immunosuppressant, it's a huge immune modulator. And it lowers that Th1 and raises that Th2, Th17. Um, and that's why you'll see like a lot of women, especially with like fibromyalgia, it was a death in the family. And they go, oh, it's just, you know, uh, a crazy woman and da da da. And which is so far from the truth. And every everything triggers more problems. Uh, with mitochondrial dysfunction, inability to detox, um, metabolic dysfunction, hormone deficiency. So this was a from, uh, I think it was like 15 years ago uh, that I did for the fiber and fatigue centers, but it still holds true in that there's certainly genetic predisposition to everything, often a triggering event in the face of stress and toxins, where you get immune dysfunction, autoimmunity, and then you get um, either a primary infection or often reactivation of a latent infection. So you get reactivation of Epstein-Barr, CMV, which is a marker of immunosenescence, um, neurotoxins, mycotoxins, um, and again, the mitochondria are affected, and once that happens, you know, everything just starts, you know, um, kind of shutting down. You have hormone deficiencies, gastrointestinal disorder, you can't sleep, you got brain on fire because of all the microglial cells. Now I'm using Lyme kind of as the uh, kind of quintessential model, but you can plug in any disease of aging in here and it, and it fits. Um, and I spent about four hours on this. So I'll let you bask in the glory of this graph. <laughs> um, so yeah, just, I don't know if it should be down because it's heavier, but uh, whatever. So uh, TH1 gets low and TH2, TH17 uh, gets raised. Uh, IL-6 is a major, uh, basically, uh, focus and uh, kind of instigator and kind of starts everything off with, you know, chronic infections, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, Sears, um, uh, MCAS, inflammation, autoimmunity, dysbiosis, neurodegenerative diseases. And the nice thing is, is that no matter what walks through your door, you can treat them basically the same as the core and then you just kind of use the different peptides that fit that illness. Um, even obesity, depression, uh, bipolar, uh, migraines, cancer, traumatic brain injury. We just started treating vets for free. So we're seeing a, a ton of traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress. Um, 
And then uh, with Lyme, the problem is people are mostly asymptomatic for, for years. And then all of a sudden they'll get something else like again, stress, toxins, or just the progression of the illness. Um, but some people never come symptomatic because they have a healthy immune system. And these people are misdiagnosed with, uh, you know, MS, autoimmune disease, uh, bipolar, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, all those things. The longer the duration, the worse the immune. Um, I, I'm that person, Ken. I got uh, AFib in my 40s from reactivated Lyme. Wow. Uh, yeah, me too. I hate a <laughs> Um, But it's interesting. Our um, executive director's husband came in with a and we gave him a big shot of BPC and it broke it. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So it's very anti-arrhythmic. Um, very cool. Uh, yeah. So so with, with Lyme, but again, works with all these diseases of aging. Um, you know, one of my favorite tests when you can get it, they usually screw it up, is natural killer cell function. Because um, like natural killer cells, uh, or let's look at chronic fatigue syndrome patients, about 75% have low natural killer cell activity, uh, or 25% have low natural killer cell number. But CD57 can also be an immunosenescent uh, cell. So um, you, you want to get the activity, and if you can, get the CD56, mast cell activation, again, mitochondria, hypercoagulation. We just, uh, it's, it's so many people have hypercoagulation. Um, also, you'll find that um, with low Th1, you can't the, you can't convert IgM to IgG antibodies. So a lot of these Lyme patients come in; they've been sick for years, and they have a positive IgM immunoblot. And then, and the infectious disease doctor says, "Well, it can't be; it's a false positive because you've had this a long time." No. And once you treat those patients, especially with immune modulators, all of a sudden they'll just shift to a bunch of IgG. All I had was a 41 kilodalton IgM, one band, and then I treated the immune system and I had six bands of IgG after that. Mm. And here's just so you know, I'm not lying, uh, uh, a couple studies showing that chronic fatigue syndrome has, again, that uh, TH1 to TH2, TH17 shift. Um, also, okay, let me ask you a question about the IgG. Yeah. Do you consider the IgG that it's, it's historic or is it still, um, you know, it's, it's still around but can reactivate? Yeah, I think the old school of, you know, you have IgM if it's active and IgG means you've had it for a long time or it's not active is not that it doesn't hold water. Thank because you. You, you even look at the studies um, by, um, oh my God, the guy at Stanford, uh, HHP6, where they used a cutoff of IgG to determine if they were had active HHV6. And, you know, kind of standard is four times the normal, but yeah, the higher the IgG, and, we, and that's what we see is we'll follow the IgGs and then they'll come down. So it really lends itself to, yeah, this is an active infection. Yeah. And Absolutely. there'll be positive IgG and then PCR positive too. Mm -hmm. um, mitochondrial dysfunction is present in most every chronic illness. Yeah, so in this one with chronic fatigue syndrome, only one of 71 patients overlapped the normal functioning of the mitochondria. Wow. Um, 
So it, it's a problem. And the mitochondria, again, stop making energy and they start uh, pumping out more reactive oxygen species, which it makes everything worse. And, and this is kind of uh, goes to um, uh, basically how uh, adrenaline and stress uh, will end up with lower cellular immunity and higher uh, hormonal and increased mast cells. And one little pearl is if you know, sometimes you'll, you'll find these patients, they have like cortisol is you know low normal, but their ACTH is very high. And what that means is that their body's trying to make more by pumping out corticotropin releasing hormone, which is a significant potent stimulator of mast cells. So uh, with those patients, you can you know treat a number of different ways or one simple way, just give a little low dose cortisol just to bring it up and lower that ACTH, which will lower the CRH. And, and here you get low NK cell and then, um, yeah, so uh, with MCAS and, and yeah, patients with POTS, we kind of don't pay too much attention to POTS anymore because they just, it just goes away with, with treatment. Um, when, you, when you fix the immune system. Uh, this is just a, uh, it's a little out of play, but um, looking at people with a chronic infection, they looked at the specificity and sensitivity of having um, uh, basically uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal dysfunction. Uh, they did a number of different central tests and things to confirm but they found that if you look here, let's say you take 12, um, it's gonna have a sensitivity of 70% and a specificity of 90%, where if you go up, it's going to increase your uh, sensitivity and lower your specificity and vice versa. So we don't do any HGH stimulation tests. They're shown to be non-physiologic, they're shown to be not very reproducible. Um, so we don't do it. And it's so safe to give just a little bit of cortisol and give their adrenals a little rest. So if they found that a fasting basal AM cortisol below 12 had the best combination of specificity and sensitivity with greater 90% specificity and 70% sensitivity. Um, oh, and also, so I've been trying to develop a new assay for thyroid um, for the last 10 years, but I think we may with a new technology, but the ACG, ACTH secreted under stress is much less bioactive than a normal non-stress person. Um, which has to do with the glycosylation of, of the protein or a peptide. And the CRH, again, becomes a big problem. Um, this just shows with the progression of uh, AIDS that the higher your TH1, the less you progress, the higher your TH2, the faster you uh, uh, basically uh, move on to AIDS. So, okay, we'll talk about peptides. Well, what, what is a peptide? It's a naturally occurring um, or analog of short chains of amino acids, just by definition, less than 40 or 50, depends who you ask in length, it's considered a peptide. If it's longer, it's a protein. Um, peptides work different than hormones in that peptides work generally on the cell surface. They're very pleiotrophic and they'll have a cascade of effects where people say, well, that doesn't sound as safe as a direct, you know, um, particular effect. 
but that's what meds do. And it's so they work more like a supplement, which has many effects. And those tend to be much safer because one thing will cancel out side effects. But when you just kind of knock out one thing, that's when you end up having problems. And the, uh, the hormones will go into the nucleus, change protein synthesis, which, which takes a while. So they're slow on, slow off, where peptides are, are quick on, quick off. Um, so they regulate most every process in the body um, in a cellular specific manner. It's another layer of bioregulation. Um, they generally have tissue specific effects while hormones have a less precise, more broad effect. Shown to be extremely safe. So many of them, like, they can't find a toxic dose at even a thousand times the typical dose. Um, you know, peptides are big, even in pharmaceuticals. Um, the big problem is their bioavailability. But let's, let's look at strictly immune modulating peptides, which you would think are going to be the thymocins. Um, I didn't put thymocin alpha one because it was a big stink that, you know, they really banned it because it was safe and effective for COVID. But, <laughs> right. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Uh, and if you look at thymus, think of thymosin alpha one as more of a TH1 booster. Thymosin beta four is a modulator with also further healing properties. Now, TB4 active frag is the four amino acids at the first part of TB4. And there's the middle part of TB4 that actually has a domain, it's multi domain that stimulates mast cells. So we didn't want that in there. And lots of studies on TB4 frag, um, again, raising the uh, TH1, works great for fibrosis, kidney disease, um, congestive heart failure, uh, healing heart after MI, uh, and, and so many beneficial things. And then BPC-157, is kind of the workhorse. And people think of it as a gut peptide, but um, every study that looked at oral versus um, either interperitoneal or IV or subcutaneous, the doses ended up being equal potent, equally effective for systemic illness. Um, again, uh, Thymosin alpha one, um, thymulin. Thymulin is another thymic peptide, and I would say it's a little less immune modulating, but it's more anti-inflammatory. And then uh, thymogen alpha one, which we call, is actually vylon uh, and thymogen. So very small peptides and. Uh, for instance, Vylon, when we did the metabolomics and proteomics, uh, it, it has some uh, pineal peptide effects and it um, uh, and combined, they actually work very well on human transforming growth factor beta, which is a major issue with chronic illness. It's, it's hugely um, uh, fibrotic. Um, and then epitalon and pineleon, uh, very similar uh, pineal peptides. And you know, when you look at the studies on epitalon, it's probably if you're going to take one thing for anti aging, uh, it would be epitalon and, and pineleon, that it it resets the pineal hypothalamic pituitary hormone effect. And they even found that it, it normalized thyroid levels even when they took out the pituitary. So it's, it's crazy. But you know, so many studies uh, show that um, you know, they had, uh, it really preserves fertility. They had, I think I have a slide here on it, where uh, menopausal rats, and they gave them all epitalon, 
and I think it was 75% uh, had normal menses after that and 25% normal live births. So kind of cool stuff. <laughs> um, uh, sleep peptides, um, kind of the key cocktail for sleep is um, epitalin, delta sleep inducing peptide and either growth hormone or growth hormone secretagog. Um, it doesn't work immediately. Like delta sleep inducing peptide is not a sleep med. It doesn't put you to sleep. It, I really believe it lowers the inflammation in the sleep center, which then allows people to get to sleep. Um, and AOD we're using more of. So brain peptides, C-Max, C-Lank, uh, Dihexa, I like a lot. Cerebralysin, which is porcine, basically brain <coughs> peptides, but they ban that. Um, lots of studies on dementia. It uh, does absorb orally. Um, and we probably get more like amazing feedback from the cerebral pep um, and people with like traumatic brain injury saying, oh my gosh, I can read now and things like that. So, and they're all, and then KPV, um, again, probably the most anti-inflammatory substance. Growth hormone secretagogues. And I, I was reading last week a couple studies, I mean, a lot of studies that shows that you know, I, I wrote a review article on growth hormone and cancer, and there's no study that's ever shown growth hormone causes cancer. One thing it does, it does increase IGF-1, but also increases IGF-BP3, which is very cancer preventive. But uh, looking at these studies, that growth hormone releasing hormone is very carcinogenic. So it makes it's making me rethink these secretagogues and increasing growth hormone releasing hormone. But, you know, uh, kind of single effect things often don't pan out. Antimicrobial peptides, LL37. Um, I remember when I first took it, I, there was no dosing. So I just said, okay, I'll do half a syringe. And oh my God, I almost jumped out of my skin. <laughs> But uh, so you got to watch out with that. We usually use that later, start low. And so many peptides are antimicrobial. And I'll, I'll show you studies on uh, BPC and KPV, um, killing fungus, um, Staph aureus, so many things. So kind of for pain, BPC, all the thymusins, eptalin. Uh, mitochondrial peptides, you know, MOTC, 5-amino-1-MQ. One of our um, doctor's daughter had OCD really bad, was pulling out all her eyebrows. And for years, they couldn't, didn't know what to do. And we gave her 5-amino-1-MQ. Within two days, she stopped pulling her eyebrows out. Um, humanin, which is very interesting, um, not the cheapest thing around, but it's called humanin because it made Alzheimer's patients human again. And there's even uh, third generation ones that are much more potent. So we kind of opened up in Mexico so we can use these things and uh, um, try to help some of these sickest patients. Um, SS31, tons of trials going on with, on that. And it's kind of like, yeah, it's a little bit like uh, uh, MitoQ, PQQ. Um, and then yeah, and that one girl with the CD, it stopped working. And then we gave her PQQ, SS31, I think one other thing, and it started working again. So I think we overpolarized her mitochondria. Um, melanotropic peptides. So, you know, it's alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, which is very anti-inflammatory. And some of the uh, Lyme docs at ILADS use it for inflammation, but uh, then you 
you know, it sounds great getting tan, but if you're older, you tend to get blotchy and all that. Um, doesn't absorb orally. KPV is a tripeptide, uh, absorbs very well. It's a little fragile in the gut, so we're doing things to protect it. Uh, melanotan 1 and 2, which is the barbidol peptide, increases libido, uh, causes weight loss, and uh, increases muscle mass. What was it? There's some other one. Um, PT141, interesting. Um, peptide, uh, it, uh, it it's weird. If you're, you got to watch out. If you take it and you're going to do your taxes, you're like, <laughs> so, but I, I haven't seen it not work. So, yeah, so we'll talk about the thymus, which, which is key. It involutes uh, starting sharp decline about age 15. Uh, it has its lowest point around 40 to 45, which when diseases of aging start and uh, causes progressive immunosenescence. And so you get increased susceptibility to infections, um, propensity for autoimmune, like this increased cancer risk, uh, increased cardiovascular disease, degenerative diseases. So here's your activity and drops right there. And then here's where you see the diseases of aging. So you can see like, why not just give the name thymic peptides here? Uh, majority of people also have pineal gland deficiency as well. According to the U.S. Center for Disease Control, approximately 80% of age individuals are afflicted at least one chronic disease as a result of the decline of the thymus. So, um, you know, it's like, how much money can we save by giving, I don't know, what, 50 bucks worth of uh, uh, thymic peptide? Uh, this is just a guy spouting out, like, why isn't anyone paying attention to the thymus? Um, so chemicals that rapidly um, atrophy the thymus, um, antibiotics, zinc deficiency, pollutants, heavy metals. Question? No, not yet. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so the, the thymic peptides boost mitochondrial function, anti-inflammatory, stimulate stem cells um, uh, tremendously. So we, before we give anyone stem cells, we'll give them um, um, uh, uh, TB4, uh, KPV, GHK. Uh, and they'll all boost mitochondrial function. I mean, uh, boost uh, stem cell function. Uh, reduce microglial activation. Uh, BPC can block the effects of EMFs on the calcium channels. Breaks down biofilms, boost natural killer cell function. Uh, so we talked about the TB4 is uh, 43 amino acids long, has multiple domains, where the TB4 frag is just the first part, it's the workhorse and the immune modulatory part. And great for fibrosis, um, 10 times the potency of TB4, doesn't simulate mast cells, it absorbs orally across the blood brain barrier and inhibits TGF beta. And that is huge. And um, uh, the, the TGF beta causes, wreaks havoc. Um, it, it causes uh, uh, fibrosis. It also lowers T4, T3 conversion, increases reverse T3, causes hypothalamic pituitary dysfunction. Um, so that's that there. Um, so, uh, oh, TB4 and MCAS. Uh, 
um, they found that TB4 <coughs> actually, even though it has that, it has that domain that stimulates mast cells, the rest of it basically take over and are more active. So they showed that TB4 was a response, not the cause. So here they gave uh, TB4 to mice with experimental um, cephalomyelitis. And uh, they found that it's a paracrine factor for endothelial progenitor cells. Uh, and so all this is a model for MS. And you know, MS is Lyme till proven otherwise. And when I say Lyme, I really mean a number of things. Um, so immune modulation is the key to all these neurodegenerative diseases. Uh -huh. uh, this shows a TB4 frag therapeutic candidate uh, um, for diseases characterized by neuronal loss and loss of memory. Um, so they showed that the TB4 frag could increase neurogenesis and repair damaged neurons. Just a couple of uh, titles. I uh, want to mention, so TB4 is restorative regenerative therapy for neurologic in uh, in injury, um, promotes the recovery of peripheral neuropathy, and also traumatic brain injury. Here is uh, looking at um, myocardial blood flow, and it basically uh, restored it and it will highly limit the effect of a uh, MI. And here for diastolic cardiomyopathy, and that's what I had such cardiomyopathy, if my heart was fibrous. And um, the cardiologist said, oh, maybe in 10 years with extensive uh, re uh, cardiac rehab, you can get 10% better. I'm like, Oh my God, you know, I couldn't even stand up. And I walked in his office a year later with normal um, uh, ultrasound. And did he even ask me what I did? No. No question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, um, TGF beta, terrible for the heart. Um, Let's see what it is. Uh, yeah, so reduces the cardiac damage and mortality after myocardial infarction. Uh, oh. And post COVID myocarditis. And they found that COVID patients had zero TB4 in their lungs. So here's. Um, uh, uh, TB4 frag orally, uh, reversed kidney damage and fibrosis. So here's a safety study. Uh, they gave a thousand times the usual dose, but no toxicity was found. Yeah, they gave up to, it's like 1260 milligrams. So you got a nice window of uh, therapeutic window there. Um, and peptides work great with stem cells. Um, uh, they increase the potency of, uh, of the stem cells. So if you want to save some money, take uh, peptides before you do the, the stem cell. And if you want a protocol uh, to do that, um, just email us and we'll send it to you. Um, Let's see, so uh, BPC is 50 amino acids, isolated in the gastric juice, um, reduces inflammation, it's healing. Um, and there's a big question on this stable BPC. So the people who had the patent on acetylated uh, BPC uh, ran out. So they came up with an arginine salt and they said, it, well, it's more stable in the, in the stomach. But three independent authors showed that acetylated was uh, totally stable for 
for 24 hours in the um, in the stomach. And the problem is, so the body will acetylate uh, peptides that it wants to keep around and protect. And so once that salt gets into the uh, intestines, it, it's going to get broken down. And it's also more polar, so it doesn't absorb as well. So some uh, doctors were adding snack to it, which breaks open the tight junctions. And we're kind of like, we're usually treating people's bad tight junctions. Why do you want to break them open? Uh, EBC is absorbed intact, which is surprising being it's uh, you know 14 amino acids. And uh, really it's, it's a go-to for so many doctors. Increases the growth hormone receptors. Um, very antimicrobial. Uh, nerve degeneration. Um, they either gave it, uh, they transected their sciatic nerve. They give it intraperitoneally or in, intragastrically, so oral. And it basically performed the same. Uh, after traumatic injury, we presented consistent failure, spontaneous healing, transected sciatic uh, nerve. That was, however, um, counteracted by marked improvement induced by PPC-157. And uh, so this, I won't go into this too much, just basically heals ligaments, tendons. Uh, Interesting, and I didn't know incontinence was such a big issue um, until I was at this uh, kind of dive bar for older individuals. And I'm like, I think there's pee going down <laughs> on people's legs. And but so just like with the stomach, it will actually tighten your upper esophageal sphincter and loosen your lower. Uh, it does the same thing for the bladder um, and will tighten that uh, sphincter and prevent um, uh, basically incontinence. Again, huge therapeutic window for that as well. Um, drinking basically in this study, water was more toxic. So gut brain, I think you kind of know about that. Um, uh, and the nice thing is it, when you look at the gut brain, you fix the gut, you still got the bad brain and the systemic illness, but these peptides will treat both sides because the brain affects the gut, what it secretes, the inflammation, the permeability. So we really like, you know, BPC, um, TB4 frag will uh, work on the tight junctions, and KPV is a uh, another one that's really can show a tremendous effects. We had a, a nine-year-old girl come in; she was going to get a colectomy because nothing worked for her Crohn's, and mother was very cautious. She was, "Well, let's just do one thing." So we did PPC. She was about forty percent better. And then we added the other peptides. Um, I think we added some uh, oral IgG, uh, probiotics, of course, and, and those things. And she is totally fine now. Um, you know, it was equally effective in treating. Oh, yeah. So in this, they had same rat. They gave them inflammatory bowel disease and multiple sclerosis. And they found that B oral BPC treated them both equally. So neuropeptides, cerebral lysin, um, it's a mixture of neuropeptides. They won't list what they are. They just tell you the amount of amino acids, very neuroprotective, and it's a blood brain barrier improves cognitive function, a lot of studies on Alzheimer's, autism, 
Um, we love treating autistic kids. They, um, some just do tremendously, but uh, it is effective orally. Uh, double blind placebo controlled study, uh, patient injected inter intravenously, um, and then evaluated cognition. Um, the SHRIBO group was, uh, was well tolerated, significant improvements in global score two months after the treatment. Here's oral cerebralis enhances brain alpha activity and cognitive performance in elderly subjects. Uh, and this was just a single dose of cerebralisin, oral dose, and they found effects within one hour on EEG, significant improvement in memory with a single dose. I'm, I'm surprised. That's impressive. Uh, improves memory and attention. Um, my uh, stepson was like getting really edgy and weird and his brothers are like what's wrong with him you know um and we gave him cerebral license and he totally mellowed out and yeah so kpv again the tripeptide the um uh, fragment of alpha monoxide stimulating hormone uh very potent mast cell inhibitor very potent antimicrobial against candida, staph aureus at pico uh, or picomolar ranges. And uh, I'll let you read that. So here it is. This is uh, fluconazole, diflucan. And then this is KPV here. So it outperformed it. And then here it is with staph aureus, even, you know, 10 to the minus ninth um, significant reduction and minus six. So very low doses work. Um, this is, let's see, this is kind of more of a thyroid case. So, We'll do that another day. Um, and these are kind of our thyroid labs, SHBG. Always get an SHBG um, because two things raise SHBG in the liver, the amount of estrogen and the amount of thyroid. So if a woman has normal estrogen, if she's menstruating um, and she has low SHBG, good chance she's low uh, thyroid. Also, if a leptin is greater than 12, uh, uh, the body needs leptin to make TSH. So the TSH is not reliable. Um, look at the total T3 to reverse T3 ratio. I used to say free T3, but all the engineers freaked out because the um, units didn't match. But you know, even a CRP in so-called normal range, but you look, and it has a direct, if you look at T3 levels and CRP, as CRP goes up, T3 goes down. And again, the uh, immune activation of coagulation is huge. Uh, CD4, CD, CD3 ratio right. less than yeah, uh, 2.5 indicates immune dysfunction, uh, high uh, C4A. Uh, human turn growth factor beta, VEGF, high VEGF will tend to be Bartonella. And then ECP, eosinomic cation protein, we use that as a surrogate for Babesia, um, where often you'll see it high normal. Then if you give them some anti-malarial, anti-Babesia med, you'll see it spike. So it's a, a good marker for that. And low natural killer cell, is typically infection, infection, infection. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, so a doctor called, I don't remember this one to it, but said a patient's last legs in the ICU with, with heart failure, um, totally fluid overloaded, low oxygen sats, obtunded, on pressors, couldn't get a bed, ongoing arrhythmias. Um, 
in and out of AFib. Uh, he said the patient had a low normal TSH and a high normal T4. Uh, he's trained the hospital, said, well, he's high thyroid. I told him, I guarantee the patient is going to have extremely low thyroid to check a you know, T3, you know, a free T3 and a reverse T3. And the hospital put up a big stink, but he finally got it. And uh, the patient was shown to have very low T3 and very high reverse T3. And so I discussed, hey, treat him with T3. He's like, oh my God, I, I can't, you know, but so we finally did, he went a little slow, but uh, I reviewed the literature with him. And as treatment was uh, titrated up, he couldn't believe it. The patient's ejection fraction improved, fluid status, oxygenation, clinical status. He was able to get it out of bed off, off pressors. His arrhythmias resolved. Um, and, uh, he says the most miraculous thing he ever saw. And he was he was uh, training to work for us, but he was a hospitalist. He was on like seven days off, seven days. And he went off rotation. And then uh, when he came back, endocrine came around and said, what is this person doing on T3? And took him off and patient crashed again. Mm. Mm. Uh, he spoke with the team, but they they wouldn't listen. Um, he said he was so disgusted at that point, he left early. But um, so peptide starting dose in general, you know, TB4 frag, BPC, um, one cap BID. Some of those start people really high, but higher doesn't generally mean better. But because it's so safe, well, uh, I often do it. And I'll start. Some people on 12 peptides on their first visit, but um, let's see. Um, and then you can add KPV, especially if mast cell. And then when you up modulate the immune system, uh, then start looking for kind of specifics. Do they have any I mean, epitalon actually should be given to everyone, but KPV, especially for like mast cell, um, uh, delta sleep, obviously for sleep, but also for brain function, tribulation for brain function, c lang C-Max, um, L37 as a, uh, if they're infected, um, dihexa, another uh, for cognitive, Humanin, we haven't used much, so the cost. Uh, this, uh, I'll let you guys read, I'll, I'll send this to you. Um, this was a, basically a traumatic brain injury patient for many years and took BPC and cerebral lysin and um, changed her life in her uh, kind of verbose. I know what this is, let's see. Hi, um, my name is Craig Smith, and a classic kind of thing when I'm a patient of a condition which is a peptide. I've seen a miraculous event, uh, <laughs> so my father in law is also doing that. And I find myself referring as many people as I can uh, to either do this or product. Uh, and I was just curious, I don't know if you guys ever sell reps or people out there um, preaching the gospel, but uh, I think better than athletes. You know, um, for me, it's been a life changer. So I was just pulling that idea. Uh, once again, my name is Craig Smith. So yeah, um, you know, it's it's nice. You get a lot of you know nice feedback. Um, here's kind of I felt were the key labs, and I you know won't go through all those, but you'll have this. And let me, I actually. Um, I probably had a slide. What happened? Oh, it was a um, video of a combat vet, or maybe it's on 
Um, you want to do questions? I have about, I have a few case studies if you want to hear those or. <laughs> well, we, excuse me, we do have some questions. Let's see. Um, sure. Some of them may be for Dr. Carter as well. Can you lab, uh, lab test for TH1 and TH2? Um, the problem with looking at cytokines, you'll see that a lot, that it, the, they're kind of, the cytokines are produced often in excess when they're trying to get something done um, uh, and, and stimulate something, but it's low. And so they, they can really lead you astray. They're very hard to do. And they, they do well in research, but clinical labs, I've been very disappointed. We have found that um, looking at the downstream effect for TH1 is natural killer cell function, and TH2 uh, and TH17 is C4A, human transforming growth factor beta, um, will uh, to us is the best marker. Got it. Can peptides be used for children? Nine-year-old got vaxxed with COVID and since has some um, erupting symptoms potentially from that. Celiac disease, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, criminal. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, we, we treat quite a bit of long COVID. Um, uh, again, immune modulation, KPV, anti-inflammatory, stem cells uh, were great. Um, nasal stem cells to get their, uh, with, with peptides to get their um, smell back. And there's a study, and I went out to Zurich to check out this machine. Uh, it's basically a plasmapheresis, but they don't have to give um, albumin back, um, and it's all self-contained, and they had a number of studies showing uh, significant benefit, benefit to long COVID. Um, and, uh, and the question is, you know, is there still spike protein around um, that's mucking everything up or still a chronic infection? Um, but with a vaccine, it wouldn't be. But um, you know, modulating that and, um, you know, things that will block the spike protein from attaching, um, ivermectin and was it BPC or sheep, one of the peptides, um, uh, what was it? It's either that or TV, but I'll, I'll get back to you on that. I'm blanking on that one. But um, yeah, we, we do very well with them. We expect them better in a couple of weeks. Is um, the current mode of delivery injection mainly? Uh, you, you talked about liposomal being something in your develop, development path, but right yeah. now. Yeah, the, the problem is, and people think peptides are so easily absorbed or transdermally, and they're not. Um, there are some exceptions like BPC and uh, smaller ones like KPV, uh, Vylon, Thymogen. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I would say that the majority, especially there's so many that are large, um, that uh, is mostly injectable. Like with uh, semaglutide, you know, they spent so much money to get less than 1% absorption. Wow. Um, what about that there might be snake venom peptides in the C19 shots? Uh, can you say that again, sir? Is there a possibility that there are snake venom peptides in the shot? Um, I think it's a possibility of anything. Sure. Uh, yeah, it's like, you know, graphene and, um, and it was interesting <clears throat> with this machine, like I was, 
I was really sick when I went to Zurich. And so I went and did this uh, special type of plasma free. So they did a live cell on me and my cells were just clumped like crazy. He's like, oh my God, in 43 years, I haven't seen this. He's got, you got a toxin. So I called my girlfriend. I said, hey, check the apartment for, to for mold. And the mold guy comes and goes, get the hell out of here. Mm -hmm. you know? And then after two treatments, he did it again and they were totally free floating. Wow. Now, would you recommend me to take a vital proteins, original collagen peptide so I can look like Jennifer Anderson? <laughs> <laughs> Sure. <laughs> hey, maybe I'll ask you out. <laughs> but, you know, those types of products, is there any efficacy of those or is it all just the, the typical? Uh, yeah, I, th there is. Um, you know, it's, you got to take, the problem is you got to take so much of it and um, it's, it's, a, it's a pain in the ass. Um, and, you know, a lot, and there's so many peptides now in, in cosmetics, they got snake venom peptide and um, all these things, but they're getting better at stimulating collagen. Um, and yeah, I, I could never do scoops of anything. All right, there's a question about using thymogen to balance TH1 and 2, and they want to you know dosing and all that stuff, but I don't, we don't want to go into that kind of specificity, but is that, is that a- uh... yeah. yeah, thymogen. So when we did the metabolomics, proteomics, um, was it a transcriptomics, that we, because we wanted to, it, when thymosin alpha one was gone, it's kind of back a little bit, that we looked at this combination and it was more potent and had the same, uh, you know, gene profile as a thymosin alpha one. So usually it's, you know, most of the peptides are the same dose, 200 to 500. Uh, thymogen and Vylon are on the lower side. They're smaller, they're lighter. Uh, so usually two, two to 300 micrograms. Now, Dr. Carter, I'm assuming that you do a general mix of peptides for prevention and longevity you want to tell us what you do oh absolutely i mean it's it's a whole variety i mean again it really depends on what you're trying to address and you know and of course uh dr holtorf has uh, created a quite a nice array of oral peptides and and then combining it really uh, i think it really kind of depends on where the person is in their disease process how fast they might want to get effects. You know, in general, you know, I found that the uh, sub-Q injections, you'll, you know, you'll get a much faster, you know, um, uh, onset of um, relief from symptoms and so forth. Again, depending on what you're trying to work with. Of course, they can be a bit more pricey and, and but even the oral ones are, are not inexpensive, but um, great for, um, you know, long term use, even the injectables, uh, you know, depending on which ones that you're using. But the peptides are incredibly safe. Like I said, I've been on them for six years, often on, you know, different ones, because there, there are tons of them out there. Of course, you know, there are 7000 peptides that have been identified, probably over 200 that have been studied and, you know, there's a, I don't know what, 20 or 30 that, you know, we are as practitioners um, are utilizing, you know, in, in different, you know, realms and so forth. But how do you deal with someone, Michael, remotely who wants to work with you to do peptide therapy? Oh, it's, it's easy, not a problem. Okay. I, just, I do it all the time. Put your email in there, anybody's. Yep, yep, input. absolutely. What, what, yeah, about, and, what about and, for something like penile fibrosis? I haven't treated it, but I would bet that the TB4 frag, GHK um, would, would be effective. 
And I have to ask another one because it's from a team member. How about hemochromatosis and Hashimoto's? What peptides would you use for that? Oh, uh, Hashimoto's is, uh, I got a whole, uh, I got a one hour, two hour, three hour. <laughs> yeah, it's hour. not, a, it sounded like you were going to, uh, that was not going to be a, yeah. Uh, uh, no, but, you, need, you need to come back. You need to come back and do a talk on that since I know that is, you know, one of your specialties. Yeah, and oh. so, you know, my big thing originally was thyroid, and that's the way I was right. by thyroid. And they found that people with Hashimoto's, that they actually feel better if you modulate their immune system better than if you give them thyroid. Well, and their thyroid will go up. And uh, with Hashimoto's almost always we dramatically drop it. It's all about that immune modulation. Right. So many of those people are infected too. Yeah, of um, course. And the worst is you look at these children, like obese children, they almost like very often have Hashimoto's and their thyroid's low and their TSH is 10 and their pediatric, you know, pediatricians don't treat them. Right. Yeah. Well, they just lose the weight. Well, they can't lose the weight if you don't you know, <laughs> exactly give them thyroid. Um, but uh, and yeah, we we want patients to go through you guys, the the doctors. So um, uh, I, I think you, you're on a, our merchant program, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. So people can you know consult with me again. We still you know Dr. Holtorf still said in the beginning. You know, you still want to look at what are the underlying things, not just jump on peptides as the end all be all. Yeah, you know? just throwing them at people doesn't make much sense. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Two other questions that I think will return. One, one is, does collagen from bone broth contain absorbable, absorbable peptides? Does uh, collagen peptides? Uh, does bone broth contain um, absorbable peptides um, uh, or collagen. No. Yeah. yeah, never thought of it. <laughs> 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 I'm not a bone broth guy. <laughs> but um, yeah, the collagen peptides, I mean, they break down to, there's some active peptides in there. Um, milk has a ton um, and uh, things you can extract out of them. Uh, like sea cucumber is pretty amazing. And what's it's interesting, like milk will have uh, delta yeah. sleep inducing peptide, you know, which, you know, you yeah. think about for, for the baby. Do you see any improvement when you have a, a fermented version, like a buttermilk or a keeper? Um, I don't the know. I, I stay out of the the uh, dietitian role because okay. I'd be too big of a hypocrite. Because you weren't trained on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like, I don't recommend exercise because I, <laughs> I, I do it religiously every four months for six <laughs> minutes. <laughs> Rain or shine. <laughs> and the last question was, uh, is how often do you have to give yourself a shot every day, once a week, once a month? That, that's probably a good yeah. practical question. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. And people say, well, should you rotate off? Um, it depends how sick. If you're sick, keep taking it. Um, if not, I think intermittent is uh, probably just as good. If, yeah. You know. yeah, probably certain things you want to pulse, yeah. You know, Absolutely. we would love to have you back. And one of the key things... Um, curious about when it comes to thyroid is the interplay between digestion, the thyroid, and the Krebs cycle, how that all links together. Because we tend, even, even in functional, we tend to put things in very tight silos. It'd be nice to sort of look at the thyroid from a broad perspective. And, and you know, autoimmunity, obviously, leaky gut, infections, things like that. But there's more to it. Yeah. Well, you got to watch out for binders because the interpatic circulation of thyroid. If someone comes in with a hyperthyroid, the first thing we do is give them binders. And it binds up their thyroid and drops quickly. Interesting. Yeah, that would be fantastic. That's a it's a hot talk. It continues to be a hot topic, especially when you have the Isabella Wentz camp and then you have the David Brownstein camp in terms of 
you know. Oh, the iodine. The iodine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I love David. Um, I don't know if I totally agree, but um, yeah. Uh, and you, yeah, you got to watch out. I don't, I've stopped giving iodine. We'll test it in house. Um, but I've stopped giving it uh, if I don't know their like Hashimoto's or autoimmune status. Fair. And 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 um, so it was when I first you know heard you talk, you were one of the ones that definitely influenced me to start using the Cytomel on patients, and yeah, definitely quite effective in you know various situations. Explain what that is, Michael. No, that's the T3. Yeah. You know? So that's the, that's the, you know, synthetic version of T3. And of course, you know, a lot of people do well on Armour Thyroid or, you know, Nature Thyroid or the WP, the whole host of those. Those are porcine derived. However, you know, a lot of people with Hashimoto's can have, you know, some issues with that. And it actually worsens Hashimoto's in my experience, of course, Dr. Holtorf has probably a lot more experience, but, you know, I did start finding that using the uh, Cytomel has been quite beneficial in a whole host of other scenarios. Right. Yeah, and do you use Thyroflex? No, I haven't used that one. Yeah, I, you know, it measures the speed of relaxation phase of your brachioradialis. Mm. But British Medical Journal showed that it was a better test than blood test for thyroid. Oh, okay. When it's done right. And I require our doctors to do it because if we happen to get an inquiry or anything from the medical board, you just throw that at them and show them all the studies and they just go, I don't know what you're talking about. And... <laughs> Yeah. As of why you're putting them on Cytomel. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Most yeah. traditional doctors frown on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They don't, they don't, they don't want you doing that. They really don't. So. Yeah. I don't like it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, I don't like it. That's, that's very scientific. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thyroidism, peptides may play a role, but you know, fi fixing thyroid for life is definitely a possible possible without having to supplement for the rest of your life it's, it's about yeah. it's about rebalancing yeah. a lot of systems not just one i agree yeah. absolutely well thank you very very thank much you. yeah well awesome. some, uh, dr carter and jody reach out about talking about uh the thyroid sometime in the new year absolutely Great. hey uh thanks so much dr carter yeah. appreciate the invite uh, looks like yeah. a very cool group hip group. yeah um, and looking forward to joining your training program in January. Sounds good. Yep. Perfect. All right. All right. Good. Good. All right. Take care. Okay, guys. Good night. All right. Roger, hold off. All right.